Lord Forsyth of Drumlean. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. Uh, my Lords, official travel advice for travellers to Nepal, including those intending to climb Everest, is available on gov.uk. The Government offers consular support to British nationals who get into trouble in Nepal, including through wardens and popular trekking areas. The British Embassy regularly discusses mountain safety with the Nepalese authorities. The Embassy has been in contact with mountaineering experts about how to improve the situation, including through the practices of summiteers and tour operators. Uh, my Lords, is my uh, noble friend aware that in the last uh, five years there have been 61 deaths on Everest and 11 uh, in the spring of this year? Um, that in one day, on the 23rd of May this year, there were 250 people trying to summit the mountain, that the Nepalese government have issued record numbers of permits this year, some 380, which allows 600 people to tackle the mountain. And the result has been that many people have been placed in danger and safety. Would my noble friend urge uh, our ambassador to lobby the Nepalese government to reduce the number of permits and to make it mandatory that people who go on the mountain, either as outfitters or climbers, are able to demonstrate proper experience and thus not put other people's lives at risk. The sums involved could easily be added to the very considerable sums which we provide through overseas aid to the Nepalese government. Yes, I, I thank my noble friend, and I think many people will be in sympathy with, with what he is saying. I, I would reassure them the British Embassy in Kathmandu regularly discusses mountain safety with the Government of Nepal, ensuring that their policies promote safety for all involved, and that was most recently done in June when consular officials met with senior leadership of the Department of Tourism. But he makes, I think, important points. Uh, the FCO Travel Advice website does, in fact, cover a number of the points which he raises. But I, I hear what he is saying, and I certainly will take that back. In, in, in agreeing with the, uh, the Lord Forsyth that this, this is a serious situation, in my experience, one of the roles of the guides is to do just that assessment of the mountaineers and those, some of those guide companies come from this country so there is a role for this country in that process but also when it comes to permits it, I'm sure that the noble minister is aware that whilst the Nepal side has increased the number of permits the number of permits coming from the north side from the Tibet side has substantially collapsed between 2018 and 2019 and does the minister agree with me that there is some element of complicating the situation with the, 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 the Tibet-China relationship and, and can the minister undertake to continue the government's work to normalise that relationship? Yes, I'm interested in what the noble Lord says. It was an aspect of which I was unaware, um, but I hear what he says and uh, certainly our government does endeavour to um, conduct and sustain a positive relationship with China. I think, as my noble friend Laura Forsyth was saying, this is an, uh, an issue of fundamental safety. It's an issue where we want people to enjoy their pursuit. It is an exciting, exhilarating pursuit. It has to be combined with safety. And certainly from the Nepal Nepalese perspective, it has to be combined with what is safe and sustainable uh, development of tourism. And I think some very important points have been made about how that progress may be impugned if proper steps are not taken. I the lady, the Minister, aware that when I, I went up the Himalayas a few years ago, the Sherpa people there told me that there was not one Sherpa family who hadn't had a member killed being a guide up, up mountains. It's only when the Europeans came up with this strange idea that you had to get to the top of these uninhabitable regions that they, because their income is low, lost their lives. Will the noble lady talk to her colleagues in the development department to try and help the income level of those families so they don't need to rely on insane Europeans going too high up mountains. I think the noble lady covers a number of, of points and I applaud her distinguished um, um, experience. Uh, I've never been anywhere near Everest myself. And, uh, <laughs> I think I can safely say that situation is unlikely to change. Um, 
the noble lady will be aware that the United Kingdom has a very good bilateral relationship with, with Nepal, and, and that includes um, um, support and financial help. Um, and one of the things that we, we have been doing is endeavouring to help with advice, for example, in climate change. We've been um, helping with disaster resilience, and we, we make a many, very meaningful contribution to Nepal in that that respect. Um, Nepal has an interesting economy. There are other tourist opportunities, as the noble lady will be aware, apart from climbing these very high mountains. Um, and I think the desire would be to support Nepal in its uh, attempts to grow its economy, and tourism is an important part of that, but have regard to the very valid points which the noble lady and the noble lord and my noble friend, Lord Versailles, have been raising. The Baroness has lightened the uh, atmosphere a little. C could I ask her whether she would be kind enough to recommend to the incoming Conservative Party leader to have a go at es Everest? Because getting to the top of Everest will be easier than getting a new deal with the Commission. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I've already got a very long list of things that I have been asked to uh, put to whoever the incoming uh, leader and new Prime Minister is. Um, I'm sure the uh, successful incumbent will note the Noble Lord's observation with interest. Uh, this will, side. Uh, uh, will the Minister accept that I have a personal interest since my father was the first man in the world to fly over Mount Everest mm -hmm. and in, in 1933, and when it was only just technically possible? Uh, and if he hadn't succeeded, I would not be here today. <laughs> uh, will, will the Minister accept that it is enormously dangerous for mountaineers? And there are, in fact, beliefs that there has been a substantial element of climate change. And I think that full preparations are absolutely necessary for those who wish to do it. Uh, yes, my noble friend makes a very important point, not least that we owe his late father's um, flight over Everest to the noble uh, lord's presence here today. Um, I'm trying to make the connection, and it may take me a little time, but I'll no doubt manage. Um, can I say to him, he makes a very important point about climate change. There is evidence that Nepal is being affected by climate change. There has been very recent serious uh, flooding. And uh, the UK, of course, as my noble friend is aware, is committed to tackling uh, climate change, and we are well placed to help Nepal develop in a low carbon way without sacrificing growth. Indeed, DFID Nepal offers substantial climate support primarily through the Nepal Climate Change Support Programme and the Nepal Renewable Energy Programme. And uh, DFID has also provided support for, of course, the important new development, the RN3 hydropower project. My lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing. My name is Lord my Lords, recruitment processes within all Home Office business areas are kept under regular review to ensure effectiveness and compliance with civil service policy. The Home Office adheres to the Civil Service Commissioner's recruitment principles and conducts pre-appointment checks in line with the baseline personnel security standard and national security vetting requirements. My Lords, there have been some 50 Home Office officials nearly all from the immigration side of the Home Office, who have been sent to prison over the last 12 years for abuses of public office. Yet the Home Office continues to deny there is a problem, indicating just a few rotten apples in the barrel. And they now seem to be seeking to conceal the names of those officials. How can the Minister justify, on the grounds of privacy, she did on a, in a written answer to me on the 4th of July, to withholding from Parliament the names of Shamshu Iqbal and Simon Pellet, who were sentenced in open court to 11 years and 23 years respectively for assisting, assisting unlawful immigration and smuggling of drugs and firearms. And this, I may say, is at a time when the Home Office is still uh, trying to stop a judicial inquiry into the trashing of the reputation of Sir Edward Heath. Will the government now take seriously, with a proper review, the possible deep corruption in the Home Office, in that part of it, indeed the possibility of, of enemies within it? 
My Lords, um, I reject uh, the, allegation, the, um, the, 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 the uh, assertions of the noble, my noble friend that there is deep corruption within the Home Office. Um, in terms of releasing names, and um, my noble friend will know that the Home Office are legally not allowed to disclose this information. We won't um, to ensure that we don't breach statutory and data protection obligations, and that's what I outlined to him. And although ne names of staff members are known in court, this is not necessarily the same as being in the public domain. The disclosure of names would have to satisfy a high standard, uh, a high threshold under the GDPR and Section 9 of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Act of 1974, which makes an offence to disclose the facts of an offence in respect of a rehabilitated person. In his 2018-19 um, annual report, the Chief Inspector of Borders and Immigration states that only half the inspector posts were filled in the last few months of 2018-19, that significantly fewer inspection reports were published than in 2017-18, that none of the seven published reports in 2018-19 was laid in Parliament by the Government within the eight weeks to which the then Home Secretary had committed in 2014, that the Home Office focus on managing the fallout from the Windrush scandal and on preparing for Brexit appeared to affect its capacity for other business, including inspections, that relationships between the inspectorate and the Home Office were generally poorer in 2018-19 than they had been in 2017-18, and that during 2018-19, the Chief Inspector had just one meeting with the Home Secretary and two with the Immigration Minister. I've heard of an arm's length relationship, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> this is an unacceptable and potentially dangerous state of affairs within a key part of our border control and immigration system. Will the Government accept full responsibility and now provide an explanation as to why they've allowed this unsatisfactory state of affairs highlighted by the Chief Inspector to arise? and then say what they now intend to do about it. Yeah. Well, my Lords, there were quite a number of questions there, one of which was um, about uh, border staff. Uh, and, of course, the noble Lord will know um, that we have um, we've, we've recruited um, almost all the uh, 900 uh, staff that we uh, undertook to recruit in, in preparation for Brexit. And um, in terms of the inspectorate, I will provide him with a longer answer in writing on that because I don't have the details uh, at my fingertips today. The real problem with the Home Office, the culture, that is still being driven by trying to achieve the target of reducing net immigration to the tens of thousands. We've recently passed legislation in this House that effectively continues free movement of EU citizens in the event of a no-deal Brexit. So the only way this ridiculous target can be achieved is by the ruthless pursuit of anyone who can, even for the most minor of reasons, de be deported. Does the Minister not agree that the hostile environment may have changed its name, but it persists? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the hostile environment, as I've said before, started under Alan Johnson and ended under my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary. In terms of his point about culture, which he has um, stated before, he's absolutely right that the culture of an organisation is absolutely key to the way its policies operate. In terms of targets, um, there aren't uh, targets uh, to, to, um, in the way that Noble Lord uh, states. We have made a general uh, uh, ambition of reducing net migration, um, but in terms of targets, uh, particularly in, in the hostile environment as he refers to it, um, they no longer operate. My Lords. Uh, I shall be concise, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, as always. Yeah. Um, does the Noble Baroness, the Minister, accept that there is a very serious problem with the Immigration Service, and that is that it is hopelessly under-resourced? Uh, the rate of uh, removals has halved. Uh, the delays are growing all over the system. Uh, does she accept that if we want an effective immigration system, as a great majority of the public do, then we have to pay for it? Well, what I would say to the noble lord in terms of problem with the immigration system, we have an awful lot of people wanting to come to this country and uh, the teams in our immigration 
uh, area are, are, are very stretched. Um, um, it does require resourcing. Everything requires resourcing. Um, and uh, I think the, the issue about immigration uh, is that we get we certainly have very high employment in this country and we do need people here with the skills required to actually fill those jobs. Jameson. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, the Government's response to the Society's lottery refor Lotteries Reform uh, consultation was published uh, two days ago on the 16th of July. As set out in the Gambling Act 2005, all society lotteries must return a minimum of 20% to good causes. The average is 44%. We expect lotteries to, will use the administrative costs saved as a result of higher sales limits announced earlier this week to return a higher share to good causes. Thanking the noble lord for that reply, would he accept that when we talk, speak about the lotteries, we talk about the national lottery. And indeed, in the statement on Tuesday, the noble lord which repeated, he said, the unique status of it. We have two synthetic national lotteries operating. And the funding from the national lottery has guaranteed that we have long-term support. And for instance, sport, we've met turned us for a first-rate sporting nation from a third-rate. Can these players in this field guarantee to make sure this long-term support is there, and if they are not prepared to, can they be restricted to operating as the other society lotteries do? Uh, well, the noble lord uh, is right that we did stress in the uh, reforms that we would preserve the uh, unique status of the national lottery, and um, that is why we didn't raise the annual sales limit uh, as much as was suggested in the consultation and as much as some of the, large, uh, the largest society lotteries wanted. Uh, and we said that the Gambling Commission would take specific evidence and look at the evidence of raising it, the annual sales limit to 50 million to make sure that it didn't impact on the national lottery. Uh, as far as sport is concerned, there's no, uh, there's, and th and there's no evidence, I, I should say, that the Gambling Commission has found that society lotteries have impacted the national lottery in any way. Indeed, their complementary in both sectors of lotteries have uh, increased in recent years. So, uh, as far as things like sport, I, I know, is of interest to the noble lord, there's no reason to think that uh, that will reduce. And indeed, for the uh, Olympics uh, next year, that uh, amount of money has been um, underwritten by the Treasury. So, the outside world will have noticed the very generous welcome given by the whole House, but particularly from the other side, to my noble friend Baron Sato when she entered this morning. Uh, it, it's perhaps uh, a bit forward of me, and I'm sure she would never do it herself, but I'd like to thank the House for their generosity on this occasion. Um, my Lords, with changes around on both sides of the House and imminent uh, adjustments to the order of things, I, I risk saying congratulations to my noble friend, uh, to, to my op opposition spokesman, who has celebrated today th three years in his position at the uh, Department. <laughs> I hope it will last longer. <laughs> my Lords, uh, may, I, may I take it from the recent statement uh, referred to by the, the noble lord that the government does accept that there is space within the lottery uh, activity in this country for both a national lottery dealing with national causes and for society lotteries, and that the figures that he quoted about the percentage of going to good causes are good, but there still remains concerns, which I think were alluded to in the statement, about the way in which some of those uh, national uh, society lotteries act in terms of the transparency of their payments and the payments they make to their individuals. Well, the first, I'm very grateful to the noble lord, and I can assure him nobody is more amazed than I am <laughs> that I've survived for three years. But um, moving on to uh, society lotteries, um, I, I, I do think that um, it's absolutely right that we, we did what we did. Um, and um, in terms of uh, transparency, uh, we agree that um, there is cause to look at the transparency, and particularly in, in what society lotteries uh, do with the money they, they um, raise. And the good causes and, and they should be clear about that and their expenses and that is why the Gambling Commission are specifically looking at that and consulting on what 
increased uh, uh, requirements are placed, particularly if we move from a 50 uh, million annual sales limit to a 100 million sales limit, which we have not said we will do. We are taking evidence on that, and that will come for those large, the very few large society lodges that it applies to, that annual sales limit, whether they should have increased transparency requirements. My Lords, uh, research shows that uh, not all lotteries which operate on a national scale uh, make it clear that they are neither charities nor not-for-profit organisations. People often don't realise that. But the noble Lord the Minister agree that making it mandatory to declare on each ticket the minimum percentage from each pound spent on charity, both for draw-based and for instant win games, would ensure that users really understand just where their money is actually going. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, there is a difference between the national lottery and society lotteries on that al already. Um, the national lottery has no uh, minimum amounts of good causes and no limits. And uh, the result of that over um, the 25 years it's been in existence is an average uh, return of 25% and £40 billion in good causes. Um, as far as uh, but, but the society lotteries do already have a statutory minimum limit. They have to... Uh, give to good causes of 20 per cent, but the average is 44 per cent. So the, the system is, is working well. In terms of the increased transparency and, and that the uh, right Reverend Prelate suggested, uh, as I said, the Gamley Commission are looking for society lotteries at increased transparency requirements and will be consulting on that. I, I wonder if more can be done to publicise the good causes. Uh, of the National Lottery, that the National Lottery funds. And I'm thinking in particular of, of uh, uh, points of sale to tell the public what is being done at local regional level. Um, I, I'm sure more could be done, and um, I will certainly take that suggestion away. I think the, uh, the interesting statistic is that for society lotteries, 55% of people who buy society lottery tickets are motivated by su supporting a, speci a specific charity. Uh, on the national lottery, however, only 15% buy a ticket to support good causes. Uh, for the national lottery, they want to win large jackpots and life-changing amounts of money. The noble Lord, the Minister, says he wants to protect the national lottery. Uh, can I offer him one short... Go on, go on. No, go on. Uh, good causes. Can we return to the noble lady, Lady Hayter? I yeah. think we uh, bitterly regret the, her removal from the front bench. She and I have had great disagreements over Europe, but I think we much regret the fact that she will no longer represent her party on this issue. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Life is lottery. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, Lord, West of, Lord West of Spithead. I beg leave to ask a question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, we have raised our concerns about the Turkish Government's purchase of S-400 missiles at ministerial and official level. Turkey is a valued NATO ally on the front line of some of the Alliance's most difficult security challenges. Defence equipment procurement decisions are for national governments, but all NATO allies have committed to reducing their dependence on Russian sourced military equipment. We will continue to discuss our concerns with Turkey as a friend and ally. I thank the uh, noble Earl the Minister for his answer. Um, this is extremely worrying for NATO. Uh, there are real issues here, as we know, with the YPG, relationships between the US and Turkey. But if I could focus on the military uh, point for, for a question. The S-400 system, a very capable surface-to-air missile system, demands input of IFF, that's uh, special settings within aircraft, and also other features of your own friendly aircraft so it doesn't shoot them down. Russian technicians will be in Turkey getting these settings. We do not wish to give Russian technicians these factors of our own aircraft. And therefore, does the noble Earl Minister not think it is absolutely correct that the Americans should be saying you will no longer be part of the F-35 programme? And if that is the case, and I think it is right they should do it, I hope we are lobbying to see if we can get that work to add to the 15% of build we already do of all F-35s in the world within this country. My Lord, I can entirely agree with uh, uh, noble, uh, the noble Lord, Lord West. He uh, uh, describes the situation uh, uh, in uh, uh, Turkey as very worrying. This is why, of course, that the um, 
uh, uh, Turkey is now being excluded from the F-35 program, both as a partner in its uh, manufacture and as an end user. And the concerns he raises concerning mixed information and the, uh, uh, the S-400 system and the F-35, which uh, counter each other and vice versa, is very worrying indeed. It's one of the uh, worrying things. Of course, he stressed the importance of Turkey as an ally and a valued member of NATO. Um, but one of the things diplomatically may be the response of the United States. Has there been any discussions uh, with the United States administrations about further possible action they may take, including sanctions against Turkey, which will have a detrimental effect of building positive relationships? Um, yes, my lords. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not aware of exact discussions that uh, uh, the Department has had over the sanctions issue. We are not taking sanctions against Turkey, but America, of, uh, 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 of course, the delivery of the S-400s or the start of the delivery, is expected to trigger measures under the uh, Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, and the severity and timeline of imposing those measures is, is still being debated. Does the noble law accept that the political implications of this matter are just as important as the military? Does he recall that Mr Putin has two twin foreign policy objectives? The first, the undermining of the European Union, to which I think he's had some assistance of the United Kingdom, and the second, the destabilisation of NATO. The difficulty is that the United States has only recently offered Turkey the Patriot system, while Turkey has bought the S-400. The fact of the matter is that Mr. Putin will not be laughing up his sleeve. He'll be laughing out loud in the Kremlin. Yeah. Uh, yes, my lords. Uh, uh, the noble lord uh, makes a, a, a number of points, including that relating to the Patriot system, which uh, um, Turkey felt unable to uh, continue with the uh, negotiations on, on, on that uh, weapon system. Uh, but, my lords, uh, the noble lords' uh, uh, points relating to relations with Russia are very worrying indeed, and it's something we're taking great concern over. As our NATO ally, uh, ally Turkey, have they indicated whether they will share with us and with other NATO nations information about these Russian missile systems? Um, I, I have uh, uh, no information on, on that uh, at present. Uh, uh, the noble and gallant lord makes a very valid point, of course, because of the whole worry of the, the systems uh, uh, that, we, um, that, that the, the Turkish uh, military are taking out. The S-400, it's a flagship weapon system, and it's designed to actually counter stealth air aircraft. And this is one of the... It'll deny large swathes of territory to uh, 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 enemy aircraft. And... Uh, it is a very worrying condition we're in at the moment. This really is a challenge for the whole of NATO. Have we discussed, has HMP discussed with the American authorities their decision to block the F-35 supplies? Because this, this raises fundamental questions about whether Turkey can still remain in the alliance, and if it doesn't, how we reconfigure to meet the new challenges which are now getting increasingly dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, my naval friend makes a very good point. As I said earlier, uh, the, um, Turkey is uh, now excluded from the um, F-35 program, um, both as a partner in a manufacturer and as an end user. Uh, but the noble uh, Lord, Lord West also mentioned that whether there are opportunities as well for BAE systems. The MOD at the moment are considering um, uh, how the suspension of uh, Turkey from the F-35 program will affect our costs, delivery timeline and possible opportunities. Shouldn't uh, we, despite the need, of course, for robust defence policy, really rather reduce some of this excessive anxiety about Russia? The United States' defence budget is ten times the size of Russia's, and Russia's defence budget is less than France and Britain. Um, my, my Lord, the noble Lord makes a point, but um, if you had listened to the questions coming from, uh, for example, Lord West, who is uh, uh, far more of an expert than I am on this issue. He actually stated quite clearly that this is a very worrying de development. Still, the F-35, uh, we could say something about the other legacy aircraft we have in NATO who will still have to operate in our eastern flanks. Are they equally vulnerable? 
um, the, the noble and gallant lord uh, uh, goes into an area that I don't have uh, information on, but as the noble, noble and gallant lord is aware, uh, we are urging our NATO allies to actually reduce their reliance of legacy Russian and uh, Soviet weaponry. Does the government think that the decision to buy weapons from Russia is a sign that Turkey is looking east rather than west? And what does that suggest for our wider relations with Turkey, particularly given it still wants to be part of the European Union? Uh, my Lord, there is no indication of yet that that, 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 that is the case. Um, uh, we have to remember that Turkey is a valued NATO ally. Um, on the front line of some of the UK's and the Alliance's most difficult security challenges. And we pay tribute to their historic uh, contribution in, the, um, in that area. We'll continue to work closely with them, my Lords, uh, and uh, seek together to face these challenges as they arise.